On today's show, we power rank the Southeast Division. Do the Heat need Damian Lillard to win the division? Are we in or out on the Atlanta Hawks? Will the Magic or Hornets be over 500? And what do we make of Jordan Poole and that era of the Wizards? All of that and more on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On NBA. I'm Wes Goldberg here with Adam Matas. However, you might be tuning in. YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Uh, so over the last several weeks and over the next several weeks on Fridays, we're power ranking every division in the NBA, predicting where each team is going to finish the regular season, get to some great categories like best offseason edition, most likely to blow it up and most interesting player. Last week, Adam, we broke down your Northwest division. Today, we're going to go to my Southeast division. Uh, last season, the Heat finished with the best record in the division, but they lost to the Hawks in the play-in tournament Earth. before getting in themselves and, of course, making a finals run and losing to your Denver Nuggets. But the Heat and the Hawks were followed by the Wizards, Magic, and the Hornets. Uh, let's start with the Heat, uh, the team that obviously played your Nuggets in the finals, so you know them well. Uh, the big story for them is if they're going to be able to pull off a trade for Damian Lillard at any point, before the start of the season, during the season, whatever. Um, but looking at this roster as is and considering that they've made the finals two of the last four years, do you even think they need Damian Lillard? Man, that's such a good question. I'm I'm a little bit more skeptical of Dame, especially with his fit in Miami, than I think most people. Uh, clearly, Miami's strength is their defense and their defensive versatility. Their weakness is their offense. You fix the problem of your offense by bringing in Damian Lillard, but does it come at the expense of that mm -hmm. defense? I mean, I, I, this is why I'm skeptical of Dame. He's just in my opinion, such a um, – his defense is such a bigger problem than I think most I, – I would probably weigh his defensive weakness heavier than most just because I've seen how much it can – a team can punish that in the playoffs. So I, that's why I'm not so sure about the fit. But, you know, the thing about Miami that's tough is I think they're a great team and I think they've overachieved a lot over the last four years. And that feels like an insult. And it kind of is an insult because they've been a very good team over the last four years, but I'm kind of discounting it. Uh, in terms of the fit with Dame, and I think the defensive concerns are legit, and it's a good thing to bring up when you're having this conversation. If you ask people with the Heat organization, they will tell you, hey, we know that Dame's not going to ever be awesome defensively, but we think he could be better than what he was in Portland here. We think if he's playing for something and he's challenged, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I just know that that's what they think, right? So right. Um, We'll and see they about that. Some, some mediocre defenders, very good. I mean, Max yeah. Schrute, and you know, they've they've had guys that have stepped in there and done their job. Yep, and and they feel pretty confident that look, Eric Spolster could scheme up a defense and and hide all of Damian Lillard's weaknesses or most of them, and 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 make it less of an issue. Like you said, they got all the way to the finals playing basically two negative defenders at least in that starting lineup for most right. of that playoff series. I think it's obviously worth it to go out yeah. and get. Damian Lillard, because their problem over the last several years has been offense. Their, their three-point shooting, their spacing is not where it needs to be. Uh, they're built around two non-floor spacers, uh, Bam and Jimmy Butler. You can add arguably the best floor spacer in the league outside of the Bay Area and Damian Lillard. Like, that, to me, is a no-brainer, and they just need to make things easier, man. Like When you say that they've overachieved, I agree with you. I think they have overachieved, and I look at that as like, okay, we could do the hashtag heat culture thing if we want, but like... At some point, you don't want to be the eighth seed and make the miraculous run to the finals. I think if you asked if you asked the Heat in an honest moment, would you rather be the eighth seed or would you rather have the number one seed like you did two years ago? They'd be like, yeah, give me the one seed every single time. Um, getting a guy like Lillard just makes things way easier in the regular season because he's a one-man scoring machine, right? He just loosens everything up. So the, pr the problem is whether or not they're going to get him, right? right? And so let's just say they had to start the regular season without Damian Lillard. Kind of figuring out what this – rotation looks like is a little weird they lose their backcourt from that finals run uh Gabe Vincent in LA with the Lakers Max Struess goes to Cleveland they sign Josh Richardson they still have Tyler Hero they still have Kyle Lowry they still have Duncan Robinson they bring in Thomas Bryant they draft Jaime Jaquez Jr. uh in the first round and that's basically their that's basically their offseason if I had to guess what their starting lineup would be I think it would be Tyler Hero Josh Richardson Jimmy Butler Kevin Love and Bam Adebayo. And there's enough there, obviously, that you're like, okay, that's a pretty good team. 
there's obviously some questions. Some people would say, hey, maybe Kyle Lowry gets the start. I don't know. I think it's going to be two of the three between Hero, Lowry, and Richardson. But I don't know. It still feels like it's missing something. You still have Caleb Martin coming off the bench, Duncan Robinson coming off the bench. We'll see what Thomas Bryant and Orlando Robinson can do as BAM's backups. But um, it's fine. It just feels like a team that would also have to kind of eke into the playoffs and make some crazy run based on Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo heroics. It's not how you would build a roster if you were just starting from scratch and saying, okay, yeah. what, what, what pieces fit? I mean, for starters, there's no point guard there. Tyler Hero, Josh Richardson, right. players, but not necessarily a point guard. Yes, Jimmy Butler can handle the ball. But, you know, do you have the floor general, the guy that organizes things and, and, and makes things simple? I don't know. And then, yeah, Kevin Love uh, – you know, also just kind of an interesting piece as you're starting power forward. It's going to work really well in some matchups and probably not so well in others. But so, yeah, it's not exactly this is the thing about the Miami Heat. It's not necessarily coherent roster construction at the moment, in large part, probably because they built their roster in hopes that it changes here very, very quickly. So, um, yeah, it is. It is a strange one. I'll also say, how do you feel about the Tyler Hero piece of this? Because him missing, you know, the playoff run last year, the run to the finals, they had clarity of who and what they were last year in a way that made them simple. And once Denver was the team that was able to figure them out, I think it, it made it hard for Miami to adjust and have more tricks mm -hmm. up their sleeve. But it did give them clarity of who and what they are. And Tyler Hero represents to me a little bit of chaos in that clarity. Look, I, I think there's two different offenses when you have Tyler Hero starting. You kind of have that Tyler Hero, Bam out of bio pick and roll offense, and then you've got the Jimmy Butler offense. And right. Sometimes they don't mesh, and I would argue that it could. I think it. Could. I think there's a world where it works, especially in the regular season, where you probably want to tilt things more towards the hero bam pick and roll, and just make things as easy on Jimmy as possible during the regular season. The problem with that is it's not as efficient of an offense when you just give Jimmy Butler the ball. Uh, and so in the regular season, maybe you're not winning as many games. But on the positive side of that is you're saving Jimmy Butler for the playoffs. But how do you strike that balance where you're doing it enough where you don't have to go into the play-in tournament? in order to get to the playoffs. Um, I, I The other problem with that is if you're trying to make it work and find some chemistry, and then you trade them for Damian Lillard halfway through the year, then you're kind of resetting the whole thing and trying to re, uh, restart right. the chemistry and, and figure all that out. So I think the Heat are going to be really motivated to try to get Damian Lillard before the start of the season for all of those reasons. Because if you just put Lillard in that starting lineup, it looks much cleaner, right? right. You got Dame at point guard, Josh Richardson at shooting guard, because they can't really include him in a trade because of the rules. Um, if it's Dame, Josh Richardson, Jimmy Butler, even call it Kevin Love and Bam Adebayo, you still have two minus defenders with Kevin Love and Dame. But it's cleaner. It makes more sense. You have a real point guard, a real floor spacer, a guy who can you just give the ball to in the regular season and say, hey, you're our offense. And everybody else defensively will figure it out. Um, that version of this makes way more sense. A hundred percent. It makes a lot more coherent sense, especially if you're able to retain some of those pieces that I love, like a Caleb Martin, you yeah. know, is a guy that I really like. Um, you know, obviously I'm curious to watch Jaime Hawkes. I'm curious to see uh, what kind of player he is eventually. But um, yeah, I'm going down the list. I'm just you looking to see if there's anybody else I like on the roster. Down. I guess Nikola Jovic, if you're able to retain him. Yeah. Did he play this year? He didn't play. He barely played his rookie year because of back problems. But the back problems were related to a growth spurt, <laughs> right? So that's so that's promising. Yeah. Um. And he look. He looks. He looks pretty good in FIBA right now with uh, Team Serbia. They're using him in a, in a in the role that I think the Heat will use or try to use him in. So there's there's some stuff I like there. Obviously, it depends on what you would have to give up in the case of a Damian Lillard trade. My question to you before we move on to other teams in this division is: when you look at the other teams in this division, does Miami? We agree it's a flawed roster without Dame. I still think they win this division. I still think they're the best team in this division. I think it's closer than I mean, last year was really close, right? Three games separated them in, in Atlanta. Yeah, they were I think it's really wins close. at Atlanta 41. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really close. Um, they're the more established team. That I trust them more probably than the other ones, but I do think there's some teams that might be more talented. That's fair. But That's it's fair. close. But it's close. Um, I think I, I'm with you. I trust the Heat more. I, I just, I don't know, man. I kind of went through these teams, and there's players that I like. There's not a whole lot of rosters that I like. Yep, that's I think it. That's that's kind of what we're gonna get into here. Uh, we're gonna move on to the Atlanta Hawks, whether or not they could fix things under new coach Quinn Snyder uh, next year in Lockdown NBA. Thank you. 
Today's episode of Locked on NBA is brought to you by FanDuel. Football season is about to kick off, and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long. Because right now, when you bet on Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time that team wins in the regular season. So just pick any team to win the Super Bowl, and you're going to get bonus bets for every victory. And then you can use those bonus bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, and more every single week to earn more cash. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Welcome back to Locked on NBA. Thanks for making Locked on NBA your first listen every day. We're going to get to which team in this division is the most likely to blow it up and then talk about the most interesting player in the division here in a minute. Let's move on. We both have Miami at the top of our power rankings in the Southeast division. Adam, I'm just going to – I'm not going to overthink this. I'm going Atlanta. It would have been more fun if you overthought it. It would have been more fun. But you know what? I'm not very good at overthinking. I'm kind of better at underthinking. I found it's kind of my sweet spot. Um, Atlanta's 41-41 and last year. They make a big change midseason. Yeah. Hiring Quinn Snyder as their head coach. Um, things start to pick up towards the end of the year. They beat the Heat in the, in the play-in tournament. They make the playoffs, and then they lose. Um, their offseason was basically trading John Collins for nothing to Utah, which we discussed yeah, in our trade. previous Power Rankings episode. Uh, they draft uh, Kobe Bufkin. They add some vets in Wesley Matthews and, 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 and Patty Mills. That's good, I guess. But I'm looking at their starting lineup. It's Trey Young, DeJounte Murray. Still some issues there in terms of can they play with each other? How much, How do you maximize that tandem? Uh, DeAndre Hunter, Sadiq Bey, Clint Capella. Coming off the bench, they've got Bogdan Bogdanovich, A.J. Griffin, who they really like. Um, uh, Jalen Johnson, who you talk to people with the Hawks, they're really high on him. I think they're kind of hoping that he pops. And then Yannick Okongwu. Uh, and then they got some other guys here and there, but that's kind of the basis of it. To me... Atlanta season, like there's guys I like here, obviously. But to hit that higher ceiling, it comes down to whether or not one of like the AJ Griffin, Jalen Johnson, Akangu guys, one of them has to pop to me for this team to kind of take that next step. And then obviously Snyder having to figure out the, the Trey Young, DeJounte Murray thing. I would almost say it's more the the second one you just mentioned there. It has more to do with Ken Quinn Snyder kind of change or really unlock the identity of this team. I, that's how I would put it. I'm not sure that we mm. have fully unlocked the identity of that Trey Young, DeJounte Murray backcourt. There's still hope. Anytime a new coach comes over halfway through the year, you know, you don't get fully settled in into what you're you're trying to accomplish. So there is hope that that's the case. But I look at this roster and I just say, is it as good as the ones that have come – in the previous couple seasons, you know, ever since their conference finals run, is it a team that is as good as that? I say at best it's even to that. So for me, Atlanta is a team I look at that to me looks almost stuck in place. Mm -hmm. And anytime a team is stuck in place for several years, you know, they have a little bit of disaster potential. I just don't know what, I mean, I I agree with you. Like they have to figure out the Trey Young, DeJounte Murray piece. We haven't seen a backcourt like that work. I don't know when we've seen it work. Everybody says, well, DeJounte Murray is the defensive guy. I think he's a little overrated defensively. Um, I, he's not much of an outside shooter, even though people, fans right. of his will point to his percentages. Nobody's scared of DeJounte Murray. Nobody's going over those screens. You know what I mean? And then the Trey Young thing, like he's kind of the guy that has to figure it out, but you're still starting two undersized guards and, and kind of elevating them as your best players on the roster. You see the problems that Cleveland is having with that. You saw the problems of Portland, whether it was Damon, CJ, McCollum, or Damon, Anthony Simons, or whatever it was. Like, I don't really know the last time I saw a backcourt like this work at a high level. Yeah, I don't I, – I, I can see it working. I like both players. I do think speed, especially in the regular season, I think in a playoffs, that's when the flaws – specifically the flaws of those two players maybe can be exploited when they're paired together. But I think in the regular season, that speed and the ability to spread you out is just so so tough to guard. Um, when teams are flying into Atlanta, a difficult place to play in general, but flying in and then you have to adjust for that level of speed. Um, you know, that that's the hope. But again, is this a serious team? I think this is, for me, below the threshold of what I would consider a serious basketball team in the NBA. You know, to make a deep playoff run or to be that kind of team. Yeah. So for me, if you're below that threshold, I just 
where are you going? What are you developing into? And then the young players, you mentioned AJ Griffin. I know a lot of people really high on him. I want to see it. Yep. I want to see him play uh, a little bit. Um, and then kind of the same goes for a Kongu. I just, I just want to see those guys kind of do it uh, more consistently and 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 in a bigger way before I, I can count on them. There's pieces I like here. And then you kind of go through it and think about how it's going to work functionally on the floor. Quinn Snyder, I would imagine high pick and roll, Trey Young, Clint Capella, high pick and roll, DeJounte Murray, Clint Capella, or DeJounte Murray, Akangu, however you're kind of stagger things and, and, and rotations. But then you're, I kind of look at it and I'm like, all right, you got, let's say Trey Young running pick and roll with Clint Capella, right? The way that Quinn that Snyder did with Donovan right. Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. That's, that's fine. I'm not scared of any of that, you know? Like, and then what? You've got DeJounte Murray. DeAndre Hunter and Sadiq Bay spacing the floor. Like, I'm not scared of any of those guys. That's right facing, yeah. So it's like, there's there's pieces I like here. But to your point, Quinn Snyder's job is going to have to be, all right, what kind of chemistry amalgamations do I have to figure out in terms of lineups? And then you look at, I was looking at their lineups last year, post All-Star break, so mostly Quinn Snyder time. Most of their best lineups include John Collins, who's not with the team anymore. Right. So I don't really, and arguably their best three point shooter of that group. So, um, <laughs> like, I don't, it's just a little, it's a little funky again, pieces. I like, I think they're really talented. I just need to see it fit together. And I think Snyder's got, uh, a tough job in front of you him. get Bogdan Bogdanovich back in healthy for a full season. I mean, that should help. He's a really good player. I mean, maybe yeah. even an underrated player. And I think Great. a lot of my favorite configurations of them will probably feature him on the court mm -hmm. in some capacity, either playing up his position at, at small forward or even just mixed in with either of the two guards. Yeah. So, you know, he could be, I mean, that would be my saving grace, but again, as much as I love Bogdan Bogdanovich, I don't know if that's me like enough to give this team a sort of direction and purpose. We'll kind see. of feels like they have a trade to make. Well, I'm yes. sure touch on that in a yes. little bit. Uh, let's move on to the Washington Wizards. I have them as my third team. Oh, wait, oh wait. man. Oh, wait. Slanderous. I can't believe it. I I might, I, my hot take is I might have had a oh, different team in my number two. I messed it up. No, no. I this was my this was ranked. I, I actually have them last. I have Orlando. Okay, I was gonna say, wow, I'm, man, we're coming in hot here with the win. They finished third last year. That's why I had them here. Oh, uh, I, I wrote I wrote down the divisions last year. So I've got Orlando. And yeah. I, I kind of flirted with Charlotte here. We'll touch on Charlotte in a second. I love the Orlando Magic, though. They go 34 and 48 last year. Um, obviously, you've got the uh the Palo Bancaro rookie season. He burst onto the scene, he's immediately a helpful player. Um, he's only going to get better. Um, put a pin in Palo Bancaro for a second. Let's look at the rest sure. of the starting lineup. Markel Fultz, Gary Harris, Franz Wagner, Palo Bancaro, Wendell Carter Jr. That's I love that. First of all, five. you just spoke. I love that starting lineup. What a yep. fun starting lineup. It's great. And then you've got Cole Anthony coming off the bench. Jalen Suggs, can he kind of figure it out this year? I really, I still remain really high on Jalen Suggs. I think there's a role for him to play. They just need to figure it out. They add Joe Ingles in the offseason. That's nice. Uh, Jonathan is Isaac nice. is hopefully healthy, and and we'll see if he could be a factor for them. Is um, he? Mova is he not healthy right now? I, I, I think he hurt. I think he's hurt again. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, I think um, Mo Wagner, um, Goga Patazdi in in that front court. They got Chuma Okiki again, a guy that I another guy that I like. They they draft Anthony Black and Jet Howard uh, in the lottery. So and, and people seem high on them. I really like Anthony Black. We'll see if the Jet Howard thing pans out. But um, they're deep. They're fun. They're young. I like the 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 vets here and there that kind of speckle the roster between Gary Harris and Joe Ingles. I like having guys like that to kind Me of too. push the young guys in the right direction. Yeah. Um, the Markel Fultz thing seems to have there, – there seems to be a renaissance last year with him. He kind of solidified that role as their starting point guard and showed some things there. I really like the Orlando Magic. I, I mentioned their record, 34-48 and 48 last year. It wouldn't shock me if they went all the way up to a 500 team this year. I am tempted to put them ahead of Atlanta as my team this wow. year. I think they're ready for this leap. I mean, not a major leap, just leap into, you know, that next that next phase. And first of all, I love Franz Wagner. I might be higher on him than just about anybody on earth. I just think he's <laughs> such a well-rounded player that's both a star and a connector, a very rare sort of thing that can go back and forth between the two. Paolo Bancaro, we'll get to him in a second. Wendell Carter Jr. has been fantastic for them. A really good defensive player. Really good all-around player, but really good defensive player that I know is one of the few guys that guards the true bigs in the league, the Embiid's and the Jokic's really well. And then, yeah, a lot of this pivots on Markel Fultz and what kind of season he can have. Like, where is he going with this? Does he still have the upside that 
um, you know, seemed stunted for all those years when he was going through, you know, his, his issues. So to me, I look at it and I just go, I love this roster. And then Joe Ingles to me is such a perfect player to put with this team. Joe mm -hmm. Ingles is the type of guy who, even though he's old and everything else, He's the type of guy that when you're playing with smart players, he's incredible. When you're playing with dumb players, you wonder what his value is. I think this is a smart up-and-coming team. There's enough smart yeah. players that you could put a smart roster around him. So I, I like it. And like I said, if I was feeling particularly hot takey, I would have them as the number two team uh, in this in this division. Uh, I think you're right at three, but I just think there's a chance that they are this year's Oklahoma City Thunder, I guess, who mm. are just seven or eight games better than what they were last year. And it surprises everyone. I like their coach. I think they're well coached. I think they use interesting lineups. I think they figure things out. And I think over the course of last season, they really figured out the lineups that clicked. My question is whether or not Paolo Bancaro should play more small ball center for them, the way that he's doing with the FIBA World Cup team. Like, I don't consider him a wing. I consider him a big man almost. I, he's a power yeah. forward almost exclusively. But could you get to lineups, especially if Jonathan Isaac's not an option? I like Mo Wagner as a nice backup. It was great for them to bring him back. Uh, and even started some minutes, uh, some games from them last year, and and was pretty good. It was kind of like a double, uh, a low end double double guy for them. But like when Wendell Carter Jr. comes off, you could go Paolo Bancaro at center again. The way the way that Steve Kerr is using him with Team USA right now, you could put Wagner at power forward easy. There's room to bring in John, uh, Joe Ingles or a Jalen Suggs or Gary Harris or Cole Anthony or whatever. Like you can kind of go with whoever that sixth man becomes. I think there's an interesting lineup um, possibility there. There another team that could make a trade. Do they want to maybe move a Cole Anthony, a Gary Harris, a Jonathan Isaac, or something like that midseason? I don't see them doing that before the season. I think that, uh, but it's something that they could do if they're like, all right, this guy kind of popped. We like these lineups. We don't have room for this guy anymore. Maybe we can make some moves, get some draft draft equity or whatever it might be. But um, one question I have for you, because you and I are on the Franz Wagner train. Like, I love Franz Wagner. I love watching him play. I love everything about him. I think he just plays the game the right way. Super high IQ player. You mentioned connector. I think it's a great word to describe him. I'm going to throw a hypothetical at you. Would you rather a Franz Wagner or Jalen Brown right now if you're a GM building a team? Franz Wagner is mean, five years younger. And not yeah, I mean, that's why this is so hard. Is, is Franz Wagner is still more theoretical, whereas Jalen Brown is a little bit more. We kind of see the, the parameters of what he can and can't be. So I don't know. I think the smart answer is probably Jalen Brown here. But I will say that I think that Franz Wagner has more of an upside than uh, – I, again, I'm higher on his upside, the possibility of him having this higher upside than most people. I mean, he does everything well. He doesn't yeah. really have weaknesses. And I we just watched a week ago him lead Team Germany to a really tight game with Team USA when he's basically the – you know, everything going through him against a team full of NBA players yeah. and NBA future stars. And there he is building a 16 point lead, just dominating and controlling the game. So I, I love his upside. Um, I, I think, I just think he's a, a championship caliber player. He might be not be a number one, you know, mm -hmm. on a championship caliber team, but he's certainly a guy that the number one guy is going to love playing with. Yeah. And maybe that number one is Paolo Bancaro. I, I will to kind of move to Paolo Bancaro. I, I, I do want to see what he does this year because he is full of talent and, you know, his rookie year and all, all those different things. You, you can't put too much weight into what kind of growth does he have or what path does he go down. But he's just a guy that I can see going down one of two paths. He has the talent. Can he put together the way that talent affects the game and really now become a, the high IQ player? Like where, how do you leverage that talent in a team system or does he become a guy who is so focused on his individual talent and grows that in a way that is maybe a little bit more Carmelo esque? You yeah. know, you're not you're not leveraging it perfectly. You're just growing the talent through the roof. And I think that one would be much more limiting to what kind of player he can be. So I, this is a big year for me for Paolo Bancaro just to see what path he's sort of walking down. I agree with you, and that's why I think this FIBA experience is going to be huge for him. Like you get to be yeah. with Steve Kerr. Ty Lu, Eric Spolstra, a bunch of winning players, guys like that. Like, I think this FIBA World Cup thing has a has a chance to really kind of push his career in the right direction. Not that it was going in the wrong direction. One last point on Franz Wagner. Um, Pal Bancaro is awesome. He's kind of the guy that people are like, all right, how many All Stars is he going to make, and all these things. I think Franz Wagner makes a couple All Star games in his career. Like, I, I think he's that kind of he's that kind of player. Don't sleep on him. You and I are on that. Um, all right, time to move on to the rest of the conference. Almost did Washington. We're going to do that next, as well as the Charlotte Hornets. A race through these two. Yeah, 
let's uh we'll do that on the other side of this welcome back to locked on nba thanks for making locked on nba your first listen every day jordan Poole finally gets to run his own offense but we're not going to talk about that yet let's move on to the charlotte hornets that's who i have um as number four <laughs> in the division sure why not i mean somebody had to do it all right can i just defend charlotte real quick i mean if I that's what you want to do I, when i first wrote my list i actually had the hornets three and orlando four man and i, I don't want to make me mad and i look i changed it and i think <laughs> i'm more with you that i think orlando is closer to atlanta at number two than number four charlotte but they go 43 and 39 the year before last and if you could have drawn up a, a season that could have went as wrong as possible for the Charlotte Hornets last year, you would have drawn up last year. Like it didn't, nothing went right for that team. Lamelo got hurt. The Miles Bridges thing was a problem. They didn't have any players that were really any good for the entirety of the season. It was, uh, they got, they had no offense to Steve Clifford, but like it kind of just feels like he's a retread on purpose. Like, hey, let's just hire him back so that, we can kind of get good and then fire them for, for a coach who actually wants to be here because they have a hard time hiring coaches there. Um, then Michael Jordan sells the team. It's like, it was like the worst possible version of a season for the Charlotte Hornets. And that's exactly what they got. But, and they go 27 and 55, but again, the year before that, when Lamelo was healthy and they had miles bridges who kind of sprung onto the scene and made an all-star push on all these things, they won 43 games. Like there's talent here. And then they add to it with Brandon Miller, who I like. Okay. Um, I don't know that I like him more than Scoot Henderson, but that doesn't matter. I think he's good right. for that <laughs> roster. Right, uh, right. Miles Bridges comes back. I like Mark Williams, their young center. I like him a lot. Um, they draft Nick Smith Jr., who, you know, I'm not, I wasn't the biggest fan of him coming out of the draft, but we'll see. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like Charlotte, when they're healthy and right, are closer to the team that won 43 games two years ago than the team that basically had everything go wrong for them last year that won 27 games. I can't get to the point where I think they're going to win 43 games. I do think that there's something to be said about like, how do you like that? The hangover after a season like last and, and just the fact that there hasn't really been a talent in like more talent added to this group in a real way. Again, we'll see what Brandon Miller looks like as a rookie, but I don't know. I I, I have a hard time. I have a harder time trying to decipher what I think of the Hornets than I thought uh, before I started doing this exercise. I'm so much lower on him. You can bring this back and, and call me for it later on in the year. But I, I, I'm i with you that, like, Miles Bridges is a really good player. You know, forget everything else. He's a really good player. Cody Martin's a good, like, role player that they yep. can bring off the bench. You know, Gordon Hayward. So they, they have some pieces, but I still feel like it's an incomplete roster. And I always worry about a young team that has a season like the one they had last year. Like, what does that do to you? What does that do to the culture? What does it do to your mentality? Because this would need to be a reset year for them in a, from a culture standpoint. And there's reason to believe that they can. You know, can you LaMelo do it? LaMelo's the guy there that we're talking L about. LaMelo has a reset this year. You know, like, yeah. there's a lot of that. But I just worry that maybe they walk down that other path for a little bit too long to expect them just to change course without a major shakeup to the roster. Sometimes you bring in a veteran player, you bring in this or that, and it changes the culture. I don't see that here. I don't see the guy that you would say, oh, that's the guy that's going to come in and change that. I mean, Miles Bridges is a great player. Is he going to change the culture? He's going to make them a better team. So I, I don't know. So I just look at that roster, and I think that um, <laughs> we're going to get to blow up potential. They might be one of the ones that gets nominated for that. I think there's a couple candidates in this in this division, but um, I'm not buying it. It's a huge year for LaMelo. Does he kind of go the Trey Young route, right? Yeah. And it's a little bit messy, and, and he's kind of – fighting with coaches and and we're not really sure if he's a guy that can lead a team um, into the playoffs and all these things, or does he kind of go a different route um, and just sort of figure things out and just become the guy like a Steve Nash kind of guy that gets everybody put in, in the right positions can run an offense efficiently. And then obviously score when he has to like, that's the big, I think LaMelo is as talented as, as any point guard, right? Like his talent is, is undeniable, but it's like, yeah, he's got the he's got his job cut out for him, right? Coming out with everything that happened last year, can he kind of help reset that culture and get things back on the right track? It's a big question. But let's move on to the Washington Wizards here. Um, interesting oh. offseason for them. They trade Bradley Beal, obviously, after going thirty five and forty seven last year. They trade Beal to the Phoenix Suns uh, in a complicated deal that basically nets them Jordan Poole, 
um, and Landry Shamit. They draft uh, Kulabali uh, in the lottery, who people are really high on, and I, I like him a lot. Um, and then they go ahead and, and get uh, Tyus Jones in the big Marcus Smart, Kristaps Porzingis trade. They they send Porzingis to Boston. So they're starting five. Tyus Jones, Jordan Poole, Corey Kispert, Kyle Kuzma, who they re-signed, and Daniel Gafford. 30th have- on defense. 30th on defense. I just nailed it for you. Oh, my gosh. That was the lineup. Oof. They might be 31st on defense somehow. I don't even know how they'll do it. <laughs> they might be. They, they'll come in. They'll come below the G League Ignite. It'll be yeah. <laughs> um, They've got uh, Delon Wright coming off the bench, Shamit, Kulaba, uh, Kulabali, uh, Denny Avdia, Patrick Baldwin Jr., who they got from Golden State. Uh, they got Mike Muscala, who's like a plus-minus king, so they got that going for him. Um, to me, the interesting thing here, yeah, defensively, they're going to be a mess. Like, this, there's no way. This team might not win 30 games. Like, they're they're going to score a bunch of points, I think, some nights, but then there's going to there's gonna be other nights where their shots aren't going in. Like, this is the Jordan Poole experience, right? There's going to be nights where he puts up 30. There's going to be a nights where he's, like, two for 28 and has, like, eight points, you know? I, like I, think, I think the nature of this team is that the numbers from, from Kuzma and Poole are going to be through the roof. They're going to look yeah. at it and be like, how are the – man, two guys averaging 24 a game or whatever, and then you look up and it's like, oh, yeah, they're giving up 125 a game as a team. Like, this might, this, this might be that version of this team. And, look, I don't think they have any – like plans to win this year. So I don't think this would be shocking. I think they're like, yeah, no, we know this. Like we're going to be terrible defensively, but we got some players that we like, like there's players I like on this roster. I, I like the Tyus Jones, Jordan Poole backcourt. You know, I'm a big Tyus Jones guy. I, I do. You are a big t- I think uh, Jordan are, Poole can only get better than what it was last There's year. what about 200 pounds between the two of them? <laughs> Maybe the thing I'm interested in, in watching, and this is kind of nitty gritty. If you're a wizards fan kind of stuff, but like the Jordan Poole, Daniel Gafford pick and roll. Gafford's kind of an underutilized but underrated pick and roll guy. He averaged 1.7 pick and rolls per game last year, but he scored in like the 85th percentile at 1.34 points per possession. The year before, it was basically similar. Um, Jordan Poole is the Warriors wanted to use him in pick and roll, but they just didn't really have the personnel. The James Wiseman thing never really worked out. Like to me, Gafford is kind of ready to be your pick and roll center, and Jordan Poole is interesting as a pick and roll, like high pick and roll ball handler. And you put him at the top of that with, with Gafford. And then you got Kuzma, Kispert, Tyus Jones. You got Landry Shamit coming off the bench. You got guys who could spread the floor around him. Like functionally, it makes sense. There's just not a whole lot of talent that's like developed here yet. But I just, that's to me like, what are you building here? And that to me is what they're building towards. I mean, here's what, here's my prediction for Washington. Embiid is not going to take a rest day when they show up on the schedule. <laughs> and Embiid's good about picking when he rested when he doesn't. Daniel Gafford, Mike Muscala, nope, he's not resting that that night. He's he he's healthy. Yep, he'll be fine. He'll be ready to go. Yeah. Defensively this team's going to be messed. All right. Let's move on to our categories. You want to go best addition first? This one's actually maybe the hardest one out of all the categories. Um rolling through them, I mean if Miami is able to add Damon Lillard, that's the best addition. But they haven't done that yet. <laughs> does he? Does he? Do we just nominate him? As, <laughs> the, hypo- as the, the, the thought, the hypothetical thought of Damian Lillard is better than any addition that, act, that was actually made in the division. I like it. The thought of Damian Lillard is the best addition. There's nothing here. I mean, the Heat add Josh Richardson, and Thomas Bryant. I, I mean, Jordan Poole is the is pr- probably the answer. I mean, we both but think you lose he's gonna- Bradley Beal. Yeah, but I mean, are we doing the both like net edition or just right. individual player edition? No, it, it that's that's not wrong. I mean, I've got I've got Tyus Jones. Yeah, <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Let's go, Tyus Jones. West. I love it. Wes's love for Tyus Jones. It's a true love story, man. I love it. I he just plays the game the right way. Um, all right, <laughs> moving on. Um, most interesting player to you. Okay, so I'm going to go <laughs> – we are just going to stay on brand today. Most interesting player, Franz Wagner. I'm excited to see him as he continues to grow as a player. I'm excited to see what he has this year. He is going to be coming off of a FIBA World Cup at the age when you see big leaps from players. So I just kind of look at him and I go, I would not be surprised if this is like a, a year where – I'm not saying it's his team because I think that's that's – you know, those types of cliches could be too much, but I wouldn't be surprised if he is the best player on that team more than people expect. More like, I, 
I'm with you. I'm gonna stay with Orlando. I'm going Jalen Suggs. Man, you I was might be I, right. I was really high. I, I love the Franz Wagner pick. Um yeah. I was so high on Jalen Suggs coming out of Gonzaga and going in that draft. And he's just had such a hard time figuring it out in Orlando. And to his, you know, to his credit, they were also trying to get the Markel Fultz thing started, get that kind of ship launched. There's Gary Harris there. There's Cole Anthony. Like there's, it was just sort of like this always thing. And then they bring in Wagner and then they bring in Ben Caro and they're so young. And I just think he had a hard time to me. Jalen Suggs is the kind of guy that can walk in and help set the table for a team that already knows what it is and kind of be a, a value add. But for a team that doesn't really know what it is and he doesn't have like this one elite skill, I think it's hard for him to sort of stand out. Can he become elite at something this year? Because this is a make or break year for him, right? Like there, yeah. we thought that maybe Toronto could take him at four. They take Scotty Barnes instead. He drops to Orlando at five a few years ago. I'm still really high on him. I love his competitiveness. There's just stuff I love about his game. You know, maybe one day he could be Tyus Jones. You know, like. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I think it's a it's a make or break year for Jalen Suggs, and and I'm really interested. In you're you're right that he is most interesting because that he has a wider out outcome. Yeah. Let's uh, team most likely to blow it up. Oh man, you could have spun the wheel on this one. <laughs> um, I don't think Orlando is going to blow it up. They, I like their team. I think they're going in the right direction. Miami, I don't think they're going to blow it up. I mean, a Damian Lillard trade is not a blow up, even though it is like a major, you know, it'd be a major trade. That's not a blow up. You're not losing Jimmy Butler or Bam Adebayo. What if, so, hypothetically, Portland trades Damian Lillard to Minnesota? Whatever. Ooh, I like where this is going. What does Miami do then? If if Dame is out, I guess they would just wait. Like, do you they wait on maybe their way to another conference finals? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe they just go back to the finals. Um, Giannis, interesting interview with the New York Times recently, saying, "Hey, if they don't show that they're ready to to win again, maybe I'm, I'm not going to sign this extension." Do they look at that New York Times article and say, "Hey, maybe we'll just wait for Giannis again and do that"? I don't know. I don't know how much longer this team could just wait around for another star. I'm not. I'm not. I, for the record, I don't think that they would blow it up if Dame gets traded elsewhere. I don't think that they would. But this it would be interesting nature. to see First of all, it's not their nature to blow it up. Like, Pat no. Riley has said this over and over again. Like, you just keep fighting. You just keep trying to win. Yeah. Oh, that would be so... I don't want to cover the same team for another year, man. Like, hey. <laughs> do something. I need to get something excited for. Um, I, will, I will say this. Washington, I don't think, blows it up because they've already sort of blown they it up. They kind of did it already. Right? They, they already did that. Charlotte and Atlanta. So that leaves Charlotte and Atlanta. Yeah. Here. And I think everybody would probably say a Charlotte, like if things go bad, do you look at this new ownership group? There's always new ownership groups always like to kind of start fresh and do this. So there's always blow up potential there, but I just look at Atlanta. There's already been rumors about Trey young and like how yep. committed is the organization to Trey young. I look at that team and I go, am I confident that they're going to be good? Absolutely not. Am I confident that they're not going to be bad? I don't think they will be, but there is a chance that that just goes really South there. And that that's the team to me that is like a sneaky blow it up potential team in part because it's logic. Like what, how does Charlotte blow it up? They trade LaMelo they there's can't. Nobody else there. Yeah. No, there's nobody else there to, to, to yeah. blow up, but Atlanta is at a point where it's like, Hey, could they move on from DeJounte Murray? Could they move on from Trey yeah. Young? Yeah. They absolutely could make that decision this year if they wanted. A little bit of a front office shakeup in Atlanta also, right? So the, the, that group that made, that was sort of in charge of the DeJounte Murray thing. And then obviously the group that was there before that, not really the same group in charge anymore. Um, yeah. I'm with you. And to me, if you do trade somebody in Atlanta, it's Trey Young. Like you keep DeJounte Murray, you kind of keep these other guys. DeAndre Hunter is a good player. I don't, if trading him doesn't really qualify as blowing it up though to me, like blowing it up in Atlanta would be trading Trey Young. Trey Young or, or DeJounte like, Murray. Or DeJounte Murray. Like if you move one of those guys, it's a huge sort of pivot from what you were doing a year ago. And that to me would be considered blowing it up. Um, and of those two, I probably think Trey Young is most likely to get traded. Would you agree with that? I think so. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I, yeah. Not not predicting that he's gonna, but if you had to pick between those two, I think we agree on Trey Young. All right. Yeah. Atlanta, most likely to blow it up. That's fun. There you go. All that right. That'll fun. do it. Southeast Division. Re quick recap. You and I both had the Heat at number one. We both had the Hawks at number two, although we don't feel great about it. Um, <laughs> we both had the Magic at number three, and we both feel very good about that. Maybe that's even too low. And then because somebody had to come in fourth, we have Charlotte and then uh, the Wizards, who could be making a play for uh, the first pick in the draft this year. I think that's kind of what we're talking about from Washington. Um, 
but it's a reset year, obviously, for them. That'll do it for our power rankings of the Southeast Division. Thanks for making Locked on NBA your first listen every day. Every day, is make sure that you're subscribed on YouTube, Odyssey, and wherever you get your podcast. The show's going to be back on Monday with the biggest stories from the NBA weekend. Until next Friday, you can find me over at Locked on Heat and Adam over at Locked on Nuggets. That'll do it for us today. Have a great weekend.